which is chaired by Kristen. Thank you, Kim. Right, afternoon, folks. We'll get cracking here because we've got a, seven speakers to get through over the next few hours. Each uh, person has 15 minutes. We're continuing, continuing our theme on saving the oceans. Uh, and I'm honored to present those seven speakers. Just to remind them that if Richard is waving that pink star, you're in deep trouble. And I will be pushing you off the stage. So two uh, of the three virtual speakers are pre-recorded and they will join us live and they will have five minutes, 10 minutes pre-recorded. They'll have five minutes to answer any questions from you. The third virtual speaker is actually doing a live presentation and hopefully will only be 10 minutes and will be able to answer questions. But what I'd like to do for the three speakers on stage is to hold their questions until the end so we can wrap up at the end there. Uh, so again, let's uh, remember that red flag. All right, I'll jump right into the first speaker. Uh, first speaker, Dr. Christine Connell Brophy, who is speaking on invasive species in the Mystic River, the marine biology of maritime history. Uh, and Dr. Brophy is Senior Vice President of Cultural Affairs and Senior Director of Museum Galleries at Mystic Seaport Museum. Come on up, Christina. Good, I thought it was going on in 15 minutes, so I'm just dilly-dallying over there. Um, nice to see everybody, uh, and I'm just going to go to the, make sure this works. This is blank. Does that matter? All right, so I can't see. Yes. Ah, awesome. Okay, well I just skipped the first one, but that's all right. So I'm so pleased to be here. Um, thank you so much for having Mystic. We actually have a really robust representation here today um, and this week. So, um, so we've already been sort of um, trying to meet as many people as we can and go through some of these new projects I'm going to be talking about a bit today. Um, I mentioned to Matthew that I had an announcement I wanted to bring to the group. So he suggested I do that quickly at the beginning of this talk. Um, so we do have a new peer-reviewed journal that we're going to launch in Q1 of 2023. Uh, many of you in the room have already been contacted about this. Several of you are already on our editorial board. But I just wanted to bring it to your attention and please ask me about it um, during the week or email me. Um, I'd love to have as many participants from this group as possible. Um, so it's a peer-reviewed multidisciplinary journal. Um, it's the first one that Mystic has put forward um, in a very long time. As many of you are familiar with our very much beloved The Log, um, that went defunct about 20 years ago. Um, and I've talked to many different organizations about what might be the next best model to think about for this type of publication. It's going to be biannual. It's going to be multidisciplinary, as I mentioned. It's also going to invite new scholarship, um, which some of that I hope my colleague, Akita burroughs Gomes is going to touch on tomorrow. Um, she's working with really a fabulous new group of young scholars at the Munson Institute, which is the only graduate maritime program in the United States. Um, and, uh, and then also the log will be digitized and online. So when I say multidisciplinary, I mean that very strongly. Um, I actually was thrilled um, to talk to the Seafarers Trust today and see what they were doing. That's exactly the kind of thing that we'd like to bring more attention to or contemporary issues in maritime world, social history, ocean health, um, and the impact that that's having on all of us and uh, sort of our global community and maritime um, activities. This is just a total mock-up that our designers just put together for this conference. It won't look like this necessarily, um, but each of these uh, journals, each of these publications will be thematic. So the first one will be on maritime social history, which is what my colleague Akia will be talking about tomorrow. And the second one will be on ocean health, a lot of the types of issues that we're talking about here today. Um, and, uh, and it'll be a very um, written for a broad audience, also include um, poetry and um, theater and artwork and the photography that you saw today. I would love that to be a cover of one of the journals, so that type of thing. But please keep that in mind, and I have write-ups for it. Please email me, and I can give you more details. I've already talked too long. 
Um, so, uh, so Mystic Seaport Museum has 500 watercraft in our watercraft storage hall. Um, but we're focusing a lot now, too, on what maritime heritage means. Uh, we have an incredible collection of watercraft, an incredible collection of art and research materials. But we're looking forward to what does maritime heritage mean at this point. Here you see my new dear friend Vincent, um, who spoke this morning. Um, we did invest, as that's come up quite a bit today, putting, um, you know, really investing in what our future might look like. What does maritime heritage mean in 2022 and beyond? What are our obligations? What's our legacy? What's our future? Where are the opportunities? And what is unique about Mystic Seaport Museum? We are never going to um, break away from our traditions and our historic past, but we do need to think about what our future looks like for our audiences moving forward. What is our impact going to mean um, to the future students and, and, um, and stewards of the sea, the stewards of our maritime heritage? So one of the things I picked to talk about today, although it's one of a million different subjects, is about um, uh, invasive species in the Mystic River. So, um, so when I first got to Mystic Seaport Museum a year and a half ago, Peter Armstrong and I started the exact same day. Um, I used to work a lot in marine mammal conservation, and that's actually the last time I was in Halifax. It was with, the, with NEWIC, the Naval Undersea Warfare Center, looking at bioacoustics and marine mammal um, impacts through shipping and other, other types of impacts. Um, but I sat with my new dear friend, uh, Jim Carlton, who's our Director Emeritus of Williams Mystic, which is an undergraduate program in partnership with Williams College. We're sitting on the beautiful deck of the Thompson Building, and I was looking out the river with him, and I said, how can we bring some more issues of conservation and ocean health to Mystic that is authentic and real to our institution? And he said, maritime history lives in the Mystic River. Um, he is one of the world experts on invasive species, and he brought to, to my attention the incredible impact of ship design, transport, and global um, traffic that has completely changed our oceans, our ocean health, and our economy, amongst many other things. Um, it was mentioned yesterday in one of the talks about the ocean not being timeless. It is very true. The ocean has changed. Our baseline has shifted. I'm a child that grew up on a boat in the 1970s. The water has changed, the ecology has changed. I was mostly in the Bahamas and the Caribbean. Things have changed tremendously. Um, so what is our impact? What is our baseline? Um, and also, what is, the, what is the baseline for Mystic Seaport Museum? And what is authentic for Mystic to talk about? We can talk about all kinds of issues like plastics in the oceans and all kinds of incredibly important topics. I think for us, our strength is to think about ship design, boat building, um, and the invasive species that live in our rivers and our visitors can actually see from our shores. So one of these is my favorites, um, the light bulb sea squirt which came from the Mediterranean in the North Sea, which is now loving living in Stonington Harbor, which is a stone's throw away from Mystic Seaport Museum. Um, what lies beneath, uh, this is actually a slide I, uh, from Jim Carlton, which is wonderful. Um, I actually have had a couple conversations with colleagues here about um, maybe the kinds of impacts that they're experiencing with archaeology and all kinds of different issues. Um, but right now there are 75 introduced marine species in Long Island Sound alone, several thousand around the world, um, and, uh, this, and much of this is familiar to all of you. Um, some of these have gone the other direction from North America over this way. So the North American comb jellyfish, which um, a lot of you are familiar with, uh, was introduced to the Black Sea in the 1980s and has completely decimated the plankton population, which has a massive influence on the ecosystems um, of those waters. The European rock pool shrimp is now the most abundant tide pool shrimp in New England. It was just introduced a couple decades ago. Um, the European shore crab came in 1817, was the first time it was noticed. But it's already been replaced by the Japanese shore crab, which has totally decimated the European shore crab. So we already have our second or third generations of invasives that are starting to take over different areas. Japanese sea anemone is another example from the 1890s. And this is how they come. They come on ships as floating biological islands. So why does it matter to maritime museums? It has everything to do with maritime legacy and maritime history. So Fallon communities, um, where, where ships were um, had organisms attached to them, and they bring them from port to port. Boring communities, which I think is particularly fascinating when you think about um, the impacts of shipworms on our very maritime heritage ports. Uh, we have many, many floating vessels, which will be greatly impacted by a much more aggressive um, boring shipworm that's coming up to us within the next 10 years from the south, which is much more aggressive than the already invasive species that exist um, in our river. It will impact our pilings. It will impact our fleet. So this is a problem that actually affects us as a museum, as does the 
I don't know, five feet of water that was um, <laughs> on Mystic Seaport this morning. Peter just showed me a picture. So half the campus is underwater half the time and when we have a big storm. So this is a real problem for many of us. Um, I'm also fascinated now of the solid ballast from wooden ships. Um, they came in rocks and then certainly the water ballast uh, from more contemporary ships. Um, and these are some examples of that. I don't have a lot of time, a lot to say. Um, but when you think about the change in ship design where, where floating vessels like the Charles W. Morgan were using rock ballast from all over the world and they'd bring those rocks from place to place and dump them. You weren't allowed to go into Boston Harbor and dump your rocks in the middle of the harbor because then the harbor would start getting shallower and shallower. So there were specific ballast points where you were allowed to dump your rocks which became totally covered with exotic plants and became this big fascination of people to go press flowers and do all these things with these fabulous plants from Africa and Europe. Again, and this goes all directions. It's not just one way. Um, with ballast water, it's a ballast rock. With ballast water, um, oh, sorry, I skipped ahead of myself. So this is the Morgan here, our beautiful, iconic ship, which went to sail several years ago. But just thinking about her travels, how far away she went, and the kinds of um, fouling that she brought around with her around the world. She was on 37 voyages. These are her ports of call. And just to give you an idea, this is actually a beautiful bar you have to visit in Mystic, um, which is actually built from some of her planks. It's called the Million Mile Bar because she went apparently about a million miles. So when you think a million miles, she's taking critters from here to there and everywhere. These are just a list of ballast flora found by an artist from Germany in the New York Harbor, just from one site. Um, and so you can see the permeation of those as well, as I mentioned, the seeds. Again, this is shifting baselines of normal. I grew up with these thinking they're native to New England. They're absolutely not. If you go to Sweden, they're everywhere um, because they're actually native to Europe, um, as well as our very lovely swans that were brought on purpose for decorative purposes um, by people settling in the States who wanted to make things look like home. Um, I just saw this yesterday in your harbor, um, coming in and out, um, and this is filled, of course, with millions of gallons of ballast water, which again sucks water in from one port and dumps them in the next. Um, this is just a, a quick sort of overview of ballast getting picked up in Morocco, then dumping it in Argentina, and then taking it to New York. Um, so there are hundreds of species of animals that are carried from place to place and dumped um, in different harbors around the world. So it is a real problem. Um, these are some of the concerns, um, economic, of course, public health, ecological, environmental. Um, so a lot of things to think about. Um, the zebra mussel has made a massive impact on Great Lakes, was discovered in 1988, and still now we don't have a real policy in place to handle these animals. So one of the things um, that was interesting to me um, is that zebra mussels have been um, or brought into Great Lakes by ballast water, but so have many other critters. One of the policies that was in play was to um, dump your ballast from coastal waters in the middle of the Atlantic, pick up fresh water that was species free, and then take that into Canada and dump it. Um, and it's found that those species were actually living on plastic debris in the middle of the ocean and making it just fine to the other shores anyway. Um, so <laughs> some of the projects we're working on, I'm just going to quickly go through a couple, is looking at the Blaschka glass invertebrate collections at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. So um, we're looking at all kinds of names from sea squirts to spineless to all kinds of things, but these were animals made in the 1870s to look at invertebrate animals from a scientific point of view. So, um, so we have a lot of reasons for doing the show, but for the purposes of this talk, um, We've been comparing that collection with invasive species in our area, and we've actually found quite a few, which is really exciting. Um, they started making these glass models because this is what an anemone looks like in a jar, and this is what it looks like in glass. So it gave scientists and students a way to study these animals um, in a much different way. Um, and we've been also looking at these in terms of our log books and diaries of primary observations made by mariners in the 19th century in the same period of these squishy things that you see them in the water and they're beautiful. You pick them up and they end up in a big blob and look like a gray nothing. So these glass models were created. This is a glass model of the light bulb sea squirt, which was not in our area when the Blaschka started making that glass. So it's one of our ways to try to bring attention to some of these issues. We also have self-guided waterfront panels that are getting installed so when people come to campus, they literally can lie on their stomachs, look over the docks, and see sea anemones from Japan, um, which is a really exciting way to actively use our river. 
Um, we have a hauling shipyard, um, as Chris mentioned yesterday. So every time we haul something, Jim Carlton and his group of students from Williams Mystic run down on their galoshes and pick off things, and they make a report to see what has been living in the river. Even though we cover things with copper paint, there's always a crack in that armor, um, and things manage to get through anyway. It's a really fun way of engaging our mariners, where someone's coming from far away. Uh, we can ask them if they would mind to have a bunch of students run down there with Jim and pick things off the bottom and see what they find. And one of those was uh, Harvey Gammon, which uh, this is just a snippet from the spreadsheet. But the biofouling communities they found on board um, and the trips that they took, they found uh, several, I can't remember how many species, dozens of species um, on the Harvey Gammon. So it's just a fun way to activate our mariners as well and kind of think about, um, not in any shameful way, but just this is informational. This is just a way to acknowledge, you know, what kinds of impacts we make on our oceans. Um, we have also commissioned Alexis Rockman to do a series of 11 paintings. One is 24 by 8 feet, and there are 10 that are about 52 by 74 inches. And this is the major painting, which has a, sort of a time capsule of maritime activities along the surface of the water, but also looks at overexploitations of the seas. But some of these are specifically related to invasive species. He's been working with some of our scientists, including Jim Carlton, on some of those issues to bring better attention. Like this one called Transient Passage is actually based on a paper that Jim just published on plastics and invasive species living aboard those. We also are getting a, a boat from Oregon, which was, oh, sorry, um, that is, uh, was covered in invasive species after a tsunami, um, kept his own ecosystem going, and we're getting that boat into the collection to show along with this exhibition. And here's our friend the lionfish. Just wanted to show a few blue economy technology things too and opportunities. This is a sneaker made by Inversa, um, which is made out of lionfish leather to try to get rid of invasives in that way. Coral Vita, which is replacing coral reefs along the Bahamas. And then this group out of Iceland, which is an incubator group looking at 100% fish, where you have very little waste and increased in efficiencies and economics. Um, facial recognition of salmon, which I think is fascinating for salmon farming. And also um, working with partnerships with major research vessels, looking into a lot of these and other similar issues like Rev Ocean, Ocean X, um, and then Bob Ballard's Nautilus and various others. And then at local community organizations like Green Wave, who are incubator groups for aquaculture, um, like kelp farming. This is one of our local farmers here who went from advertising to aqua farming um, a couple of years ago and has had great success. And I just wanted to mention this one was just discovered by Jim last week, uh, the red spotted anemone, which is now in Mystic River. So um, it's a brand new one. We don't know how many there are, but they're also there. So what we're hoping to do with these and other projects is to really bring attention to our site, our unique site, but also that we're just a tiny microcosm of a global issue. So if you have 70 species in our little estuary, little river brought in by, ship, um, by ships over time, imagine the rest of the world. So it's a really um, global issue um, that, that we're trying to bring attention to using our own resources in-house. So I hope I, I'm not paying attention. So I'm, I think I'm good. <laughs> All right, but thank you very much. Thanks, Christine. All right, uh, our next speaker is virtual, uh, Louise Sanger, who is speaking So it is Alina. Right, Christine, you're going to have to come back because you were supposed to be second. All right, my apologies for that. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Uh, Helena Yolson Ekstrom, who is. the Head of Exhibitions at the Maritime Museum and Aquarium at Gothenburg uh, will be speaking on Oceans and Collections, the Maritime Museum and Aquarium at Gothenburg. And Helena, my absolute apologies. Uh, you're Wells Nextrum, and I work as Head of the Aquarium and the Exhibition Department at the Maritime Museum and Aquarium in Gothenburg, Sweden. 
I will here tell you a little bit of big project in renovating the museum and opening up a whole new museum. So we show you a few slides and pictures here from our process. The Maritime Museum and Aquarium in Gothenburg, Sweden, rebuilding and extension. The museum is located just above outside the city centre in central Gothenburg, uh, next to the sea. Uh, so why a renovation? Uh, the museum was in great need to improve standards such as best visitor flows, improved accessibility and a better work environment for the employees. In September 2018, we closed for the public, so four years ago, construction pro process occurred uh, and this March 2022, we had, had the availability to move back in. And now in December, we will open again to the public. So the history of the museum and aquarium, it was founded and opened in 1913, in the beginning run on a small scale. The current museum was inaugurated in 1933 by the Swedish King Gustav V. So next year we'll be celebrating 100 years. The aquarium has been rebuilt several times and contained both tropical and Nordic departments. Uh, the decision to build the museum was taken officially in 2015 by the local government after years of discussion question. And uh, organization, we are part of the museum sector in the city of Gothenburg, cultural administration. We have three units, the aquarium, collections, exhibitions and public activities and are around 30 employees in total. We have uh, many exhibitions which overall aim to explore the relationship between man and the sea over the ages. We have a wide range of activities as well as our exhibitions, talks, children activities, sit tours and boat trips. We have a big collection with emphasis on maritime history, many ship models and designs. And our vision to create a unique combination of cultural history and marine biology and create the unexpected. And our mission illustrate Swedish maritime cultural history and promote the idea of a living sea. We believe in lifelong learning and want to make people reflect on and question issues. Together with the world at large, we want to create enjoyable activities that challenge our visitors. So what's happening and what's been going on? We'll have a new shop, a new aquarium below ground, a new cafe and restaurant, new permanent exhibitions, a temporary exhibition, new park, better availability, better work environment and safety, a brand platform, new website and a visual identity. Here is a draw from the early stages from the architect. You see the big aquarium underneath ground. You have the entrance floor and the cafe and the shop. You have the two top floors filled with exhibition for as well young and older ones. Here is a picture from the outside of the museum and the new entrance. And here from inside our new entrance hall and new stairs up to our exhibition rooms. And now we will go beneath the surface. We have the aquariums and the ocean lab, which is the new part of the museum. Here is also a draft from the architects from 2016, showing the new aquariums and the surroundings. Also a draft from the architect uh, in the early process. Uh, so, the aquarium hall, at the center of the aquarium hall, the focus is of course on the oceans, their organisms and environments displayed and explored in various ways. Habits from various parts of the oceans are shown in different types of aquariums. Around 15 are planned for in the aquarium hall, including the largest, a 400,000 litre aquarium showing a living coral reef. The ocean lab uh, in the pro 
project focus on marine education and provide school classes and other visitors with an opportunity to explore the sea and its habitants in a more hands-on way through lab benches, experimental aquariums and petting tanks. It also provides excellent means for the presentation, presenting the aquarium's own research, such as the cultivation of corals. Here are a few pictures from the building process of the new aquarium. We're digging deep in the ground, putting down to the right biggest uh, windows for the uh, largest aquarium. And here also a picture from the same site outside the museum. Of course, in this process, we've been engaging with the public. We have been out talking to school classes, uh, to older ones, to younger ones. What do they want to see in the museum? What do they want to see in the aquarium? Uh, what do they like? What they do they don't want to see? Uh, so there are a few pictures from that. In, we find we have a great dialogue with our uh, community and our public. Here you see a few pictures from the new aquarium. To the left we have our five marine biologists just putting down the final coral stone in the biggest aquarium a couple of weeks ago. But not only an aquarium, we have also a new exhibition for all ages. Here a picture from uh, just today uh, showing uh, our carpenters uh, in hectic times uh, trying to make everything ready for collections and other things, objects to put in place. Uh, but we will have a wide range of new exhibitions from the youngest one, age one to three, uh, a playroom, create bubbles, that sounds fun, make friends with octopuses, hide in big barnacles. Here, with the overall aim to experience the feeling of being underwater. And here, we also collaborated with a science school in Gothenburg called Ordico and their program, Child Culture Design. For the older children, aged 4 to 10 years, they have a, a playroom, an exhibition called The Great Blue. The purpose of this is to awaken the love, fascination, and respect for the sea in the tension between fantasy and reality. Through play and exploring with all the senses, visitors get to know the sea and their own relationship with it. And here we try to focus on climate psychology and learning for sustainable development. Our new large permanent exhibition, Sea of Stories, is about 430 square meters. And here we try to bring to life over 400 years at sea and in foreign ports through personal stories, real life characters, events during ocean expeditions, colonial operation and dangers at sea. And over 350 objects will be shown from our own collections, pictures and movies as well. And themes include the crew and the passengers word on board, dangers at sea, war, forces of nature, Expeditions, Swedish colonizers, tools for navigation and trade. We will also have a temporary exhibition called Shipyard Memories. Gothmo used to be a big shipbuilding uh, city with a lot of shipbuilding industries. And here uh, you have an extensive suit of portraits and art photog photographs, interviews, quotes and sounds. And the exhibition gives an insight into what everyday life looked like at Gothenburg's major shipyards. Women and men, workers and civil servants in a variety of professions give both us trivial and dramatic stories. Ship models, the heart of our collections as we say. More than 30 ship models are on display. Everything from simple boats to super tankers. The room is intended to serve as an entrance to the subject of shipping with a focus on ships and basic things such as how can something heavy so float, why are the ship models, etc, etc. So, uh, been rushing you through those pictures and uh, this project and uh, the new museum, we, fingers crossed, will be opening on December 10th. 
uh, with the overall aim. We will offer experience across generation boundaries and will be a place where dramatic mythology and the latest research meet. It contains the unique content and museum experience that interdisciplinary tells about life above, below and at sea level, with the overall focus how to create a sustainable relationship between man and sea. And I'm really sad I can't be with you live uh, today in Canada, Halifax, but hoping you're enjoying the conference. And uh, please don't hesitate to contact me. I have my email address here. And uh, don't miss to follow us on our website and on Instagram and on Facebook. And uh, hope you can make it to Sweden at some point and Gothenburg. And bye bye for now. Devin, do we have uh, Helena on there? No, we don't. All right, we'll save a few minutes. All right, we'll get cracking. You know, I, it always reminds me, uh, Ray Ashley, many of you may know, is the head of the San Diego Maritime Museum. Fantastic organization, an incredible chap. He always said that if we ask children what is your choice between visiting a maritime museum or an, or an aquarium, that's a rhetorical question for a child. So maritime museums should partner with aquariums because everybody will go to the aquarium. And they've knocked it on the head in that regard. Very, very lucky. All right, so we're going to get Christina back, Christine back up here again. Teasing. All right, I think I've got the right one now. All right, our next speaker is uh, Athena uh, Tragigas, who is employed at the National Museum of Denmark in the field of environmental archaeology and material science. Uh, she's an editor of the Journal of Nautical Archaeology and on the board of the Advisory Council on Underwater Archaeology. And Athena is speaking on Cultural Heritage Framework Program. Have I got the right speaker? I would like to thank the organizers of the International Congress of Maritime Museums for inviting me here today to speak about the Cultural Heritage Framework Program. I'm presenting as chair of the Ocean Decade Heritage Network, ODHN, which is supported by the Honor Frost Foundation in the UK. ODHN chairs the Cultural Heritage Framework Program which has just received support from the Lloyd's Register Foundation, and which I'll discuss in more detail during the course of this presentation. First, I'd like to introduce the framework in which ODHN and its CHFP operate. After several years of preparation in 2021, UNESCO's Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission launched the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development 2021 to 2030. The Ocean Decade. The initiative promotes a common framework for supporting stakeholders in studying and assessing the health of the world's oceans. The broadest aim of the Ocean Decade builds scientific capacity and generate knowledge. By design, the decade fully recognizes that there needs to be a paradigm shift in how ocean or marine science is obtained and knowledge is generated. The ocean decade is directly linked to sustainable development and forms part of the UN's 2030 agenda. The scientific knowledge that is generated during the ocean decade will directly inform solutions to the aims of a range of the 17 SDGs. The goal that expressly addresses the marine environment is SDG 14, Life Below Water. There is no specific goal on culture or cultural heritage. Across the 17 goals, cultural heritage appears only as a target of SDG 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities. On the face of it, the absence of reference to cultural heritage in the SDGs might seem problematic it might be regarded as even more problematic that cultural heritage appears under one SDG and the marine environment under another. However, much of the emphasis on the 2030 agenda 
is that the SDGs are all to be dealt with as a whole. Cultural heritage, both tangible and intangible, is being framed in terms of its relevance and contribution to all 17 SDGs. Similarly, the ocean decade is concerning itself with the contribution that marine science can make to as many of SDGs outside SDG 14 as possible. Nonetheless, we have to acknowledge that cultural heritage, or as UNESCO tends to use the term UCH, underwater cultural heritage, because of the 2001 convention, but we insist on using the term MUCH, maritime and underwater cultural heritage. So nonetheless, we have to acknowledge that MUCH is usually a minor partner to the natural sciences in the marine environment. Even if culture and marine science are seeking to demonstrate the relevance across the whole 2030 agenda, it might not be immediately clear how. There's a paradox here. Public interest in MUCH is considerable, as we can also see from the numbers of visitors to maritime museums globally. There's quite high awareness and cultural heritage is often an integral characteristic of what people enjoy and seek out at the coast. MUCH already makes a significant contribution to the environmental, social, and economic pillars of sustainable development, at least in some parts of the world. The paradox is that this is under-recognized and relatively little is done to support or enhance the contribution that cultural heritage already makes globally. The Ocean Decade Heritage Network was formed in 2019 with the dual aims of raising awareness in the cultural heritage community about the Ocean Decade and coordinating a targeted global response from this community to improve the integration of cultural heritage within the marine sciences. ODHN represents a key stakeholder group of the decade, cultural heritage specialists who work in marine, underwater, and coastal environments, including marine maritime archaeologists, heritage managers, anthropologists, and ethnographers. Taking our cue from ocean, ODHN encompasses all aspects of cultural heritage that are touched by the sea, marine, maritime, nautical, submerged, underwater, intertidal, coastal, littoral, and archaeopelagic. We also take on board the value of source to sea perspectives and recognizing the importance of rivers and inland waters and understanding human relationships with the ocean through time. We want to ensure that in raising awareness about the decade and related activities, we are inclusive. We engage a growing network of stakeholders through our website, social media, conferences and workshops. We organize working groups addressing policy and practice and provide consultations. We share information on upcoming conferences and meetings, network activities, projects and resources making this information available and accessible through the network. Membership is free. We argue that the Ocean Decade presents an opportunity to increase the contribution of cultural heritage to sustainable development. Indeed, ODHN has also argued that cultural heritage is indispensable to the Ocean Decade if it wants to achieve its objectives in Region 7 stated societal outcomes. These outcomes include a clean ocean, a healthy and resilient ocean, a productive ocean, a predicted ocean, a safe ocean, an accessible ocean, an inspiring and engaging ocean. As a recognized partner of the decade, ODHN is coordinating a targeted global response through chairing the Decade Action, the Cultural Heritage Framework Program. The CHFP was endorsed in June of 2021 as one of the first actions, and to date, it is the only endorsed Decade Action that addresses cultural heritage. The CHFP is one of the ways that ODHN is hoping to affect a paradigm shift in how to transform ocean science and underscore the cultural significance of the ocean. Throughout the ocean decade, 
A direct link is being made between science and measurable changes in the world conditions. Halting the decline in the marine environment depends on people. Hence, understanding how people behave and have behaved with respect to the sea is critically important. The wealth of knowledge generated from the cultural heritage data about past materials and society's interaction with the sea can and will play a significant role in delivering SDG 14. The main support for the CHFP is from a generous grant from the Lloyd's Register Foundation, which I'm happy to announce here for the first time. We look forward to also coordinating with the Lloyd's Register Foundation's Heritage and Education Center. CHFP's point of departure is that cultural heritage encompasses intangible as well as tangible heritage. Human interaction with the historic environment, embodied in traditional knowledge or maritime living heritage, is essential to understanding our ocean present and to forecasting change and its implications for human well-being and livelihoods. An inseparable part of the marine and coastal environments the physical remains of past human interactions with the sea can inform the present. Both intangible and tangible cultural heritage can help us understand how coastal and marine ecosystems achieve their present form and to identify the pressures upon them. It can provide historical data sets to help us gauge future patterns regarding pollution, impacts of climate change, and the time depth for other anthropogenic and natural hazards and establish ecosystem baselines. CHFP aims to assist and support cultural heritage stakeholders and act a paradigm shift through the proposed decade actions, programs, projects, and activities through facilitating co-design and encouraging best practice and managing data and knowledge. The operational objectives of CHFP are to showcase integration of heritage and ocean science, develop capacity, enable greater diversity and representation, encourage ocean literacy, public engagement and outreach, and encourage effective and efficient communications between many stakeholder groups, including those in and inside and outside the ocean decade. The CHFP's mode of operation is to provide infrastructure, encourage, share, and support decade actions relating to cultural heritage, provide advice and assistance and consultancies to other decade actions that touch on ocean cultural heritage, and encourage their association with the CHFP, reach out to other networks and initiatives related to the ocean decade, and share that share common strands with ODHN and the CHFP. Our thematic priorities at present are to focus on indigenous and traditional knowledge, coastal and marine heritage and SDGs, heritage in areas beyond national jurisdiction, ocean acidification and cultural heritage, potentially polluting wrecks, addressing climate change impacts through citizen science and other stakeholder groups, and mutual training in cultural heritage and ocean policy. In conclusion, the CHFP aims that together, decade actions relating to cultural heritage will have a greater overall coherence during the decade than if this framework were absent. Duplication will be avoided among networks, programs, and projects and activities relating to cultural heritage under the umbrella of the decade and beyond. And expertise will be promptly available for responding to inquiries from stakeholder groups regarding the decade its calls, its institutions, and contributions. We want to acknowledge the power of cultural heritage as a medium for engaging the public and addressing the sustainability of our coasts, 
seas and oceans. To investigate, protect, and celebrate long-standing relationships between people in the global seas. I reach back the theme of this session, Saving the Oceans. Maritime museums can and already are effective advocates for marine conservation and ocean science education. Cultural heritage uses and advances hard sciences to obtain data from the seafloor, to uncover details of past environments, or to understand and conserve fragile materials. But it's essential to interpret such data from perspectives within the humanities or to frame the value and importance of heritage to current communities in terms of the social sciences. The ambition of the CHFP is that by the end of the ocean decade, the historical dimensions of people's relationships with the sea will be integrated within ocean science and policy. The ocean we want will be inspired and informed by the long and diverse histories and living heritage of people and the sea. Thank you. All right, Devon is is uh, she is on. All right, uh, Athena, can you? I hope you can hear me. Uh, we hope we may have some questions from the audience, from the attendees here for you. All right, you've got off scot-free. She's gone, all right. She is there. All right, Matthew, you've got a question? Great. Great to see you, uh, Athena. Is anybody any questions now that we've got her on the screen? Yeah, yeah please, Matthew. Uh, thank you very much indeed for that, that very wide ranging. Uh, now, can you hear me now? Yes, hello there. And thank you so much for that very wide ranging uh, introduction to the ocean uh, decade, which is obviously something that is very close to maritime museums. But could you describe perhaps a little bit how you think that? maritime museums might play a particular part and really contribute to this, this what feels like a, a multinational big project. How can we as smaller institutions play a part? Uh, that's, <laughs> I'm getting, I'm getting some back, back here, here, so I hope well. you can hear me. Uh, it, there are many there are levels, levels, and that's what we're trying, trying to engage through, through this, this cultural, cultural heritage, heritage framework, framework program. program is that there can be actions and there can be overarching programs and there can be projects. So there's many different levels to engage. And museums, maritime museums in particular, are something that we'd like to engage with through the Cultural Heritage Framework Program, simply because they're, so, they're repositories of so much qualitative and quantitative information. Uh, that's really relevant to understanding, especially ecosystems uh, and robustness of, of present day ecosystems uh, and, and baselines, but also uh, just in terms of um, climate change information as well. Um, so this is information that's hopefully going to be um, more present and, and brought forward uh, through different initiatives and and making that relevant um, to both directions to um, to the people who are traditional marine sciences and the ocean decade, but also uh, within people within the cultural heritage uh, uh, sector themselves. So this is something through, um, we're trying to focus on the term maritime living heritage as well to also uh, encompass these, uh, these initiatives. Uh, so it's, it's reaching out through museums and we hope to do that now that we have the support from the Lloyd Register Foundation uh, to, to move forward and, and engage with uh, as now Lloyd Register uh, Foundation is also a partner within uh, the International Congress of Maritime Museums uh, to really start engaging. Uh, and it's also, um, I would say now as the decade is also gaining momentum, it's important also at a national level for many maritime museums to reach out to their own uh, decade committees. And these do exist they're not very obvious in many cases, and they're usually dominated by the hard marine sciences. And this is what we're trying to, to change. So uh, if you take a look and engage in our network, we're 
providing information on, on those points of contact and also points, uh, regional points of cultural heritage and maritime living heritage points of contact to start engaging in starting these dialogues. So it's, it's still, even though we've started uh, the decade in 21, everything is still developing very slowly, even on national platforms. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there's not more than a decade to go. We hope to enact some changes by 2030, but certainly what we hope to do is not going to stop in 2030. So please do get in touch with us and we are happy to have consultancies with our variety of experts um, to, to start thinking about these types of ways to engage. All right, thank you, Athena. All right, anybody has another question? All right, I think we're good. Thank you very much for participating. All right, take care. All right, I hope you all noticed that I deliberately juggled this up to keep you on your toes. And now Kim's made sure I am on my toes, which I am. All right, our next speaker, Louise Sanger. Louise studied maritime history at the University of Hull in the UK, and she works for the